Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are in the world today, and welcome to our webinar, A Light Look at the Chemistry of Chromatography. Hi, I'm Joe, I'm your host, and I just want to thank you for taking time out for what will be another very informative presentation in our expert series of webinars. At first, I've just got a few things to highlight to you all uh, as we're using a new system here. Uh, on the right-hand side of your uh, main viewing screen, there should be a questions panel. Please feel free to ask questions throughout this presentation uh, just by typing your questions into the, into the submit box down there on the right-hand side, because at the end of this session, there'll be a Q&A where I'm going to read out all the questions that we received, and our expert presenters today will uh, help answer them as, as fully and best as they can. Um, so we've got some time at the end of this presentation for that. Uh, we've also got two new interesting features. One is a request a sales call on the right-hand side of the viewing screen. Uh, one click on that will open up another window which will uh, enable your email to us. Um, the email field's filled in for you, so you just type away your message. Uh, we'll receive it, and then we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Now, if you're watching this on, on, on the on-demand platform, uh, obviously it'll be done through working, the working week, not, not at weekends. There's also a very short survey. Uh, this will pop up at the end, but you can actually activate the survey as a small panel of uh, array of icons underneath the slideshow today that you can activate any time during this presentation. And one of those on the far right is a survey. So please do take 45 seconds, a minute, just to answer those questions for us, because all the information you give us really helps us serve our customers much more effectively. OK, so today you're going to hear from two of our most highly regarded scientists in our business. Uh, they both work for the Specs brand under the Certi Prep uh, division. Um, and uh, we're going to say a quick hello to them now. So we've got uh, Patricia uh, and Alan. And I like to drop a very interesting fact about these two. Now, you can see their bios on the right hand side, on the left hand side of your screen. Um, but just aside from that, um, Patricia graduated from Rutgers, and Alan graduated from Princeton. And apparently, these two colleges have the oldest football rivalry in the history of football going all the way back to 1869. So I'm hoping that there's no uh, funny business today on the presentation between these two. They are very good scientists and very good colleagues, so um, that, that's the most important thing here. So I hope you're ready for today's presentation. Uh, I'm now going to hand you over to Patricia. Hi, and welcome to today's webinar. Today we're going to talk about chromatography. Now, if you want to know the definition of chromatography, it literally means writing with light. And we use it every day in all of our laboratories, especially our analytical organic laboratories. But where did it come from? Chromatography is pretty new. It only has existed for about 100 years, give or take. It started out when a scientist filled a column with material and passed a extract of, of plant material through it, and it was separated into different bands of color. So this was the very first instance of chromatography. Ever since that very first experiment in the 1900s, we have developed chromatography over the years. In the 1940s and 50s, we had Nobel Prize winning work of partition chemistry, and then we started getting things like uh, TLC, thin layer chromatography. And then we developed into our modern chromatography, which is started in the 60s and 70s, including the very first uh, commercial GC or gas chromatography system by Hewlett Packard in 1973. So we have really taken off with this field of chromatography over the last 120 years. Chromatography is based on partition science or partition chemistry. This is where the mixture that you have partitions back and forth between two different phases, a mobile phase and a stationary phase. The mobile phase, as it implies, is mobile, it moves, and the stationary phase stays still. So for classic chromatography, something like a, a paper chromatography or a TLC thin layer chromatography, you have some sort of plate that you spot with your mixture, you put it in a bath of your mobile phase, and over time, those spots of your mixture start to migrate up the stationary phase and separate into the different bands of compounds. Now look at the modern columns. You want to look then 
to this stationary phase being in the center of a column, like a stainless steel column or a, a plastic or a polymer column. And you have your stationary phase inside, and your mobile phase will flow through it. So you have your mixture, and as it goes through column, it starts to separate through interaction with the stationary phase and the mobile phase. It partitions back and forth between the two phases. So partition uh, chromatography needs multiple phases. You need that stationary phase, and you need that mobile phase. And depending on what the material of those stationary and mobile phases are, we have the different types of chromatography. We have the solid stationary phases. We have liquid stationary phases. And then we have mobile phases that are either gas or liquid. That's how we get our gas chromatography and our liquid chromatography. That's also how we have our paper or our thin layer chromatography. So for our modern liquid chromatography system, we have our solvent system. These are our reservoirs, our degassers, our mixing chambers, and things like that that ultimately lead to some sort of pumping system. And then that will go to our injector. Now, if you're old enough to remember the very first chromatography system, they were usually manual injection. So you had a needle, you had an injection port, and a valve. You'd put your needle in, you'd inject your sample, and then you'd have to, to open up the, the valve to inject, and then more than likely you had to close it again. Many a sample was lost because a scientist forgot to open and close the valve. But now we're lucky, we have auto samplers. And then those auto samplers lead to a column. This is what does the actual separation for us. And this is where you also have different switching valves so you can do different types of experiments. Finally, that information or that separated column uh, component information leads to a detector. And we have a whole host of different detectors for liquid chromatography, like UV, mass spec, RID, and, and so on. And then you get your data. Your data is the chromatogram. That is the actual data you get. A chromatograph comes from when we had plotters plotting out our peaks. And if you're old enough to remember, the very first chromatograms were produced on chromatographs, which were ink plotters, so you would have a pen, it would draw the different peaks on graph paper. You would pull your paper off of the plotter, and then you would have to count the squares underneath the different peaks in order to calculate your area. Then you have your auxiliary waste systems and your gases and any other extra materials that you need. Some uh, LC systems have all extra components. They have maybe fraction collectors or, like I said, a waste system or things like that. Now we have our very first lab hack for you. Do you have solvent bottles in your laboratory, kind of like the ones on the screen here? So you have these squeeze bottles. You use them for cleaning. You use them for topping off things. But are they constantly leaking and shooting out liquid on you? Well, you can actually put a hole in the bottle, and that will stop the bottle from leaking. If you take a small pinhole or, and put it on the very top near the spout, it just relieves a little bit of pressure. But one note. This could be hazardous, so you want to keep these bottles under a hood because by putting that little hole, you're letting some gases evaporate, some, um, some pressure in the bottle evaporate. So you're going to want to keep that safely under your hood. Uh, hi, everybody. It's uh, good to be working with you, Patty, again. I really enjoy these webinars. All right, so solvents. This is, in some ways, one of the more complicated uh, parts of this whole uh, process. Which solvent do you use? And it's going to uh, vary uh, depending on your, your application. Um, but you, you have to be very, very uh, cautious when you look at uh, different uh, solvent classes like, uh, like ACS grade. Um, usually, these are solvents that are greater than 95%, but um, sometimes 95% is nowhere near enough. And it's going to depend on what impurities you have to be concerned about. So for example, HPLC grade, there's a, an extra effort to make sure there's no um, uh, you know, particles that can get into the system. And you want to make sure there are no impurities that will give uh, UV absorbent. Um, you know, UV applications uh, you know, will give you solvents uh, that, that don't have uh, chromophores that will uh, uh, mess you up. Food and drug applications, you've got to make sure that you don't have impurities that can uh, affect uh, 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 dietary uh, uh, issues, biotechnical ones, 
uh, you want to make sure there's no nucleic acids in there that might show up in a PCR uh, amplification. So you just have to be uh, very, uh, you know, very cautious and look up the uh, individual solvent uh, that you're interested in. You'll be amazed how many different methanols there are, and uh, uh, they all are a little different. So uh, uh, what affects your choice of solvent once you, uh, you know, once you've decided what grade of solvent you're going to use, uh, the main issue is polarity. As Patty mentioned earlier, you have a, a, a solid phase and a mobile phase moves molecules through the, uh, you know, through the, uh, the column, for example, and uh, the polarity of that solvent will uh, affect how quickly the different analytes go through the column. So if you're dealing with uh, uh, you know, polar analytes, like alcohols or carboxylic acids, let's say, you're going to need a pretty uh, polar solvent. So um, uh, if you're working with hydrocarbons, uh, you're going to use a more lipid um, a solvent, and you may mix these together. In terms of polarity, you, know, you, can, you can have uh, protic solvents like, uh, like alcohols, uh, or you can have aprotic solvents, you know, like acetyl nitrile. Uh, and then you can have antiprotic uh, solvents as well, which have uh, both uh, uh, species within them. When we look at polar solvents, we're really looking at their polarity index. And they have a polarity index from water, which is very polar at 10.2, all the way down to the like, toluene and the alkanes and the cyclohexanes, which are about 0.1. So if you're mixing solvents, this becomes an issue because you're going to want to calculate what your polarity is of your solvent if you're going to mix them together. So a common mixture is water and acetonitrile. So if you're doing 50-50 acetonitrile and water, well, water has that 10.2 polarity, and acetonitrile has a 5.8 polarity. So you're going to multiply each of those by 0.5, and that will give you the polarity for each of the components, and then you add them together. So instead of the 10.2 or the 5.8 of acetonitrile, if you do a 50-50 mix, you're going to have a polarity of 8. Another important issue is miscibility. Will two solvents mix together? You really don't want to be using two solvents that mix together. You'll have different layers, and that's really going to mess with your HPLC system. So you're going to want your solvents to mix together. And they mix together when they are alike. Remember that old adage, like, likes, like. So if you have a polar solvent, then it's more than likely going to be soluble in another polar solvent. If you have a nonpolar solvent, it's going to be soluble in another nonpolar solvent. And then you get a little bit of leeway with those that have a mixed polarity or they have polarity somewhere in the middle. Those are usually the bridges to get the different types of solvents into solution together. So here we see a chart of solvent miscibility. So if you have your acetonitrile, you can see that it mixes with everything, but it doesn't mix with your nonpolar solvents like your heptane or your hexane. So you're going to either want a bridge compound to go in between them or a bridge solvent to go in between them, or you're going to want to not mix those two particular solvents. In some cases, you're going to want to add a buffer or a modifier or an additive to your mobile phase. These are used to adjust for pH, to change the pKa. Some types of common buffers are things like salts or acetates or phosphates. So if you're doing HPLC, these are very common buffers, sodium acetate um, or different phosphate. Now, if you're using LCMS, then you're going to want your buffers to be more volatile. You want for them to aid in ionization. And you also don't want them to have salts. You don't want them to create salts or, or different residues. So you're going to want things instead that are like formate or ammonium compounds, like uh, formic acid, for instance. These are going to give you um, ionization aid, but they're also not going to create salts, which are going to basically gum up your detector or start to layer on the outside of your ionization chamber. So you're going to use different type of buffers depending on what type of pH range. If you want something like a formate, then you're going to have a pKa of about 3.8 with that, and you're going to have a pH range from about 2.8 to 4.8. And you have a UV cutoff of 210 nanometers, and it's very good for LCMS. Now, when you're using a modifier or a, a buffer to change pH and, and pKa, especially in LCMS, you're going to want to remember the rule of thumb, two units above or below. 
So if you are having compounds that have a, uh, a pKa of 5, then you want your target for your buffer and your mobile phase to be 2 units above or below. So you want it in that range of about 3, or you want that in the range of 7 if you're going in the other direction. So that's a, a rough rule of thumb. This will actually help with the ionization of those compounds. I want to give you some final thoughts about solvents. By their very nature, solvents are hazardous, and they have health hazards. They're volatile organics, they're semi-volatile organics, meaning they have boiling points that are uh, around room temperature or very close to, to room temperature, close enough that as they evaporate, they, they fill the air, they have very high evaporation rates, and you're breathing them in. So if possible, we always suggest that you put some sort of trap system on your HPLC or your waste system, something like, like our vape lock system. This will lock in those different fumes, and they will stop them from being a health hazard in your laboratory. Let's now switch to columns. So I've got your second lab hack for you. Now, we all take our columns out of the box, and we'll usually write on Sharpie on the box when we opened it and who opened it, what did we start using it. Instead of doing that, why don't you actually write on the column? Put the date on the column, and I suggest you put an arrow on the column if it doesn't already exist on what direction of the flow you're going to be using the column in. Because routinely, scientists like to rotate columns. We backflush columns. And it's always helpful when there's an arrow to show it what direction of normal use it's going in. So if you take that column out of the box, put the date on it right away with a Sharpie on the label, and put an arrow if one doesn't exist already to show what direction of use you're going to be using. If we go back to the idea of polarity, that has a lot to do with what type of chromatography you're doing. Are you doing reverse phase chromatography or are you doing normal phase chromatography? The difference is in reverse phase chromatography, your mobile phase and your stationary phase are, are opposite in nature. So you have a polar mobile phase and a nonpolar stationary phase. You have a C8 or C18, an octadecal column, and you have a polar mobile phase like water, acetonitrile, methanol, and things like that. So that's reverse phase chromatography. What started it, though, was normal phase chromatography, where the mobile phase was nonpolar, but the stationary phase was polar. So in this case, you had nonpolar um, mobile phases and things like the cyclohexane and the hexane and things like that, and you had the, the polar column, like a phenyl column or a meno column or something like that. That was normal phase chromatography. And for the longest time, that was the delay of the land. But over the last 30 or 40 years, we have now changed more and more to reverse phase chromatography, and that's what most people use nowadays is reverse phase chromatography. So let's, take, so let's take a little bit more of a look at the anatomy of a column. If you broke open a column and very simply took a look at what was inside it, you would find that it is filled with solophase, and it's filled with particles. They could be round. They could be asymmetrical. They're all different types of, and shapes of particles and sizes of particles. What is considered to be important is the internal ID. So it's internal diameter of the column, and that, that is the width of the inside of that column. Now, some of those particles out, when you see particle size on a box, you'll see it's a, a 5 micron particle or, or 3.5 micron particles or something like that. That is the, the particle size of the silica particles that are the, the backbone for the particular column structure. And if closely at it, you'll see that there is a lot of space inside a column. There's a space between the different particles. There's also spaces within the particle itself. They have pores. And these are the void volume spaces. All of this actually matters. And I'll show you why this matters. There's something called void volume. This is the amount of volume in a column that's all that interstitial space. So this is uh, spots that are uh, voided in the, the column itself. And it becomes important because as you run your samples, you have the time of an unresolved peak. This is called dwell time. So if you're doing a chromatographic run and you inject a sample and five seconds later you start to see peaks, well, are you really seeing peaks or are you seeing basically ghost peaks because those peaks really don't exist. They're in that dwell time, valve to time. So 
in order to find out how quickly a unretained peak will go through your system, you can use a calculation. So you could go through the calculation and find out how long it should take routinely for that peak to go through. So if you're using a column which is a typical inner diameter of one point, uh, excuse me, four point six millimeters and maybe a fifty uh, millimeter length, you would have a void volume of about 0.58 mils. Now, if you're running at 0.1 mil a minute, which is something like for maybe a, a, a super LC system, it's going to take you about six minutes before you see that peak. If you're running at half a mil a minute, it's going to be about uh, 1.16 minutes before you'll see that peak. If you're running at one mil a, uh, one mil a minute, then it's about oh, three quarters to half a minute before you're going to see that peak. So this time matters. This calculation matters. Because you're going to want to know what's realistically the amount of time I have to wait before I'll actually see, see real data on my chromatogram. So let's say you really just don't want to don't want to do the equation. The equation is pretty involved, and you really don't want to have to figure out all the different variables for the equation. Well, there's a hack for that. Instead of using the equation, you can take an under Retained peak or an unretained compound, something like caffeine or something else like that, that you know is unretained for your system, and you inject it and then you watch your clock. And the minute you see a real peak for that caffeine is then the first time that you'll be able to see any other unretained peaks. So that becomes now your, your dwell time. So if it takes two minutes for you to see that real caffeine peak, then your dwell time for your system with your tubing and all your setup is then two minutes. Or you can use the rough uh, table that we used that before we showed you before. There's also a difference between isocratic and gradient methods. Isocratic means that your solvent composition never changes throughout your run. So if you have one polarity like that eight from the acetonitrile water mix, that polarity is going to stay throughout the entire run. Now, this is good for some reasons and bad for some reasons. You're not using the changes of polarity of your solvents to force your peaks to partition back and forth between the two different phases. So you're actually going to have to let the column do all the work and the mobile phase do all the work. There's no um, changes allowing for those peaks to be forced out sooner or retained later. But there are reasons for this. If you have an RID system, you have a closed cell that you put your mobile phase into in which that system compares as it's blank. And you need that, that cell not to change. So you don't want to be changing the composition of your mobile phase because you already have a retained cell as your reference. So you're not going to be able to have a gradient in that case. So you're going to need an isochronic method. But if you can, you should use a gradient method when possible because you use the power of the changes in the polarity of the mix of the solvents to force the partitioning back and forth of your compounds between your mobile phase and your stationary phase. And there are different portions of a run. There is, of course, that first dwell time. That's that area where um, your system is kind of ramping up and you're, you're waiting for that first piece to appear. Then you have your gradient method. This is where you build from whatever your initial conditions are to what your final conditions are going to be. And this is where you get the benefit of changing the polarity of the different solvents in order to force those peaks to partition back and forth. And then you have a time where it's a flush, where you're at maybe 100% acetonitrile, or you're at 100% of an organic phase. Um, this is the general rule of thumb. Is you start out more aqueous and you proceed to more organic. Because the more organic is going to be more closely matched to your column phase. If you have that nonpolar column, um, and acetonitrile has a lower polarity than the water does. So you're actually forcing it more to come off of that column. So you're getting rid of any late retaining peaks. So that 100% uh, organic or that very high organic becomes part of your flush. Then you have to uh, build in an equilibrium time. That's the time for the pumps to switch back over to what your starting conditions are. And more aptly, it's that time it takes for that solvent, that new solvent condition to hit your system. If your dwell time is two minutes, then your solvent equilibration time has to be at least uh, about the same. It takes the same amount of time for that pump uh, to put that new solvent mix 
through and get it to that column and to that injector where you want it to be. So you want to build in a, an equal amount of um, equilibrium or re-equilibrium to your system when you build your method so that you're not kind of overlapping that dwell time where you haven't quite changed all your conditions back to the start again. Now let's take a closer look at what the anatomy of the stationary phase is. We already discussed that there are silica particles, and the silica particles then will have sort of silanols or uh, silica coming off of them. These are the sites where you now attach the different backbones to your um, mobile phase, or excuse me, your stationary phase. So the stationary phase is going to attach to those points, but they're not going to attach to all of those points. They're going to attach to some of those points. It's not 100% coverage. So you're still going to have open silanol, and you're going to have open active sites on your um, silica particles and on your column. And these stationary phases are things that we're well aware of, the, the C8, the active decal, the C18, the phenyl. These are the, the actual molecules are what the stationary, uh, stationary phase is composed of. Then you're going to have something called end capping. End capping is when the column manufacturer adds some component to the column after the, the stationary phase has been placed. And this will then cap or stop those active sites from interacting with your mobile phase and interacting with your analytes. And this is good for, for many reasons. It's good because it keeps the column robust. It allows the column to last longer because it's not constantly being attacked at these active sites by your different polar mobile phases, your nonpolar mobile phases. It also stops any uh, band spreading of your different analytes because you don't have all these extra spots where it's unintentionally interacting with the column material other than your stationary phases where, it's where you want it to interact. So what kind of uh, column phase should you choose? Well, we're going to take a look at that now. Column phases are chosen by the chemistry of what you're trying to look at, so the chemistry of your analytes. Are your analytes soluble in water and polar solvents? If they are, then you're probably going to be doing either ion exchange or reverse phase chromatography. If they're not soluble in polar solvents, but they're soluble in nonpolar solvents, you're probably going to be doing normal phase chromatography. And then your choices are uh, a lot more limited. For a normal phase, you have things like the cyano, the silica, the amino phases. And for the reverse phase, you have a lot more choices. You have um, the choice of whether your particular compounds are ionic, are they polar, are they neutral, are they mixed, and then are they acidic or basic, are they hydrophobic or hydrophilic. So you have a lot more choices for the different types of phases for your stationary phase when you're doing reverse phase. So a very typical type of reverse phase chromatography are, are polar columns, uh, acetic or basic, and then you're going to use things like a C8 or a C18 column. And those are very typical types of column phases for liquid chromatography, reverse phase chromatography. Next, we're going to talk about some of the different types of detectors. We're really going to focus uh, today on the UV vis detectors, on, on the light, you know, writing with light. But there are lots of choices for detectors. You have uh, refractive index detectors, which we discussed earlier, fluorescence detectors, we have nitrogen detectors, and of course, very popularly, the mass spec, or LCMS. And uh, LCMS is, is a big field and would take an entire webinar to itself. But let's go a little bit more into detail about the UV vis. And for that, I'm going to hand it over to Alan. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Patty, for that uh, uh, great review of uh, the basics of, uh, of HPLC. We got into uh, detectors, and that's uh, an excellent transition for me to start talking a little bit about uh, UV vis. Uh, in, in more specific uh, details. So um, uh, you, you're probably familiar with the, um, the general electromagnetic wave spectrum that goes from the teeniest little UV, uh, sorry, the teeniest little uh, uh, waves of very, very high energy, which are gamma rays, uh, which, which are uh, a thousandth of a nanometer in, in length, uh, all the way up to uh, radio waves, uh, which are uh, you know, gigantic large uh, waves. 
Uh, UV vis is uh, sort of in the middle. Um, the, the vis is the region that we're all familiar with. Those are the colors that we see. Uh, if, you, if you make the wavelength a little bit shorter, you're in the ultraviolet region. If it's a little broader, it's in the infrared region, which is where heat starts to come in. Uh, the, um, the, the whole key to uh, UV vis spectroscopy is the absorption of energy, which is uh, uh, dependent on the uh, polarizability or the energy level of the electrons that are uh, in the molecule. So if your molecule uh, only has signal electrons, like a, like a simple, um, you know, let's say alkane, um, you're going to require more energy to uh, absorb uh, light than if you have uh, a lower energy electrons, like pi electrons, basically polarizable systems, aromatic, conjugated uh, double bonds. Uh, these will uh, absorb in the, uh, in the, in the visible uh, region. Um, if you uh, if you know enough about the, um, uh, the properties of the different functional groups in an organic molecule, you can actually use, use UV to help you um, determine the structure of a, of a molecule. So this, uh, this table uh, shows the uh, absorption uh, energy or the wavelength that's required to, uh, to give uh, an absorption spectrum. Uh, you can see uh, smaller... Um, uh, less conjugated molecules like uh, alkenes or alkynes uh, absorb in the 180s, whereas like further down, you've got benzene rings and naphthalene rings that are more in the, uh, the 200s. Um, uh, on the right side are solvent molecules. You, you need to make sure you're using a solvent that doesn't have a peak that interferes with the sample that you're, you're analyzing, um, and uh, that will uh, uh, have a... a have a, have a great degree of effect on your, uh, your, your results. Um, so um, this is a, an opportunity to bring up uh, our fourth lab hack. Now this, uh, this, this is useful if you uh, understand the concept of complementary colors. So when a molecule absorbs, uh, let's say, violet, then the complementary color that you're going to actually observe is yellow. Whereas if a molecule absorbs at, a, at a, a, a larger wavelength, like red, in the 600 region, uh, the red is now removed from your uh, full spectrum, and what you see is, is like a blue or blue-green color. So um, uh, that can be a helpful way to get a feel for what kind of materials you're working with. Of course, you have to be uh, concerned that you might have impurities in your, your, com your, your compound, your sample, and the impurities may have very strong absorption in a completely different region. So you have to be a little cautious with, uh, with color. So th this is a helpful uh, uh, trick to be aware of. So working in the area of uh, UV um, of, of this spectra, uh, we've just uh, introduced a new line of internal standards for UV. Uh, we, we use uh, internal standards in uh, uh, LCMS and GCMS. It gives you uh, peaks of a known size and a known concentration. And then you can compare the height of your samples peak with that of the standard. And that will uh, give you an indication of, of how much uh, sample you actually have. Now, of course, if you're doing a simple UV experiment, you might take a solid compound, weigh it exactly, and then dissolve it in a known amount of volume in a cuvette, so you know how much material you have. But if you have a decomposition that's occurred with your compound over time, and you want to see how much is left, or if you're doing a kinetic experiment, you might have the molecule mixed in solution with a, with a protein, and you want to measure uh, how much that protein is uh, uh, converting a substrate to, uh, you know, uh, to a metabolite, uh, or you're looking for inhibition of a, of a compound that doesn't uh, absorb when it's bound. Uh, this is a, a great tool that you can use. Uh, so in this example, uh, we have a, um, a, a dye molecule uh, dyes, in general, uh, by their nature, absorb in the visible region and have strong colors. So, for example, this, uh, uh, this uh, dye molecule uh, here has a strong absorb uh, absorbance in the 500 region, uh, and as a, as a result is, is a bluish-looking uh, compound. Um, this dye molecule uh, we, we have dissolved at a, a very specific concentration in solution and we added, in this case, a sample of different concentrations, 40 microliters, 80, 80 microliters, 120 uh, material added. And you can see, as there's more and more of the sample, 
uh, it shows up relative to the standard, and you can use that ratio to determine exactly how much uh, sample is in your uh, your mixture. Uh, because each, uh, our, our, in this case, our sample is absorbing at 400, so using a standard that absorbs around 600 is, is ideal. But if your sample absorbed at 600, then you would take a different using this uh, internal standard that absorbs, let's say, 400. So we, we have a, a, a series of about seven or eight different dyes that absorb a different region depending on what your needs are. So for example, uh, if we take that previous experiment and we uh, calculate the ratio of the peak on the left to the uh, uh, peak on the right, which is the internal standard, and we plot that against the amount of material that was actually added to the cuvette for each experiment, we get the uh, correlation shown here, which had a, a, a very nice uh, R-square value of over 99%. All right, Patty, uh, back to you. Thanks, Alan. Well, hopefully uh, you've been finding this presentation interesting. Let's just leave you with a few final thoughts. When you're considering your different portions of your HPLC system, your liquid chromatography system, it's actually a fine balance between your instrument function, your solid phase, and your mobile phase chemistry, and your uh, conditions for your system. So you really to select the instrumentation that is going to maximize your results. So make sure you're picking the right detector for the, for the right type of compound. You're going to want to really look at the functional groups of those compounds. You're going to want to look how they're going to interact with your solid phase, how they're going to interact with the particle size and the pore size. So you're going to need to do some methods development for it. And you really want to be familiar with your mobile phase chemistry. What's the polarity of your system? What is the, the UV cutoff? Are you doing UV experiments? You need to know the UV cutoffs of your different solvents and your different additives. What's the miscibility? If you're going to mix two uh, different mobile phases during your run, are they going to be miscible with each other? Are you going to have to worry about boiling point or ionizability or pH or pKa? So you really, uh, if you use the, the different charts and, and the different information that we've given you, it'll give you an understanding of how all of these things fit together, and you'll be able to maximize your efficiency and really help your different sample processing along, you'll be able to really get into the, the details of your methodology. I want to thank you for joining us. And if you do need any chromatography equipment, let me give you a, a brief snapshot of what Cole Palmer can offer to you. So for our specs line of chromatography products, please just take a look at our website or talk to one of our sales representatives. We have a full line of all different types of standards and other chromatography processes. I hope you've enjoyed our webinar, and we'll see you again soon. Right, uh, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate that. Um, I'm just um, going through the questions. So we did get uh, quite a few questions during that presentation. Um, but I just want to, one, one, a popular question, I should say, uh, was are the slides available um, after this is finished? And yeah, the short answer is yes. We're going to give out, um, we can give a copy of the, P, uh, the slides in PDF format. Um, but we're asking for people to complete our survey. And in the bottom right of your screens, there's a little pink icon that says short survey. If you guys click on that, it will um, open the survey up into your screen. So we really appreciate you taking some time, 45 seconds, a minute, just to fill it out for us. Um, and then all those people that do, we'll, we'll, we'll um, email a copy of this deck in PDF format to you all. So um, really appreciate your help with that one. Um, We've had we've had an array of questions, so I'm going to start with um, a question around the standards. So um, the question was, do you do standards for urine organic acid analysis by GCMS method? I'm not sure if that's for you, Patty. I'll take it. I'm sure Alan will have something to add to it. Um, we can do organic acid standards. And we do have the ability to have urine as a matrix. We don't have a native urine standard that measures the native organic acid content. 
But if there are particular compounds that are needed in a urine matrix, then that can be uh, ordered as a custom. Alan, did you have anything to add? Uh, I, I know, uh, at least with some organic acids, it, 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 you get better results if you uh, esterify them uh, ahead of time with like diazomethane or diazobolt or something like that. Uh, but uh, no, that's all I, I could add. Okay, brilliant. Um, the next question was, what are the best ways to transfer a method that has been found online and, and can the method be used as, as written? Well, if you have a, an LC method and it matches the conditions that you are already running, so you're running a similar type of system, you have a similar column size, then yes, you can, you can definitely use that as a starting point to tweak your method. But if your uh, system setup is different than the original conditions, you're using a different column size or a different particle size, then you're going to need to translate that method. That's going to change the flow rate and the amount of time it's going to take for your peaks to actually go through the system. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you're going to want some sort of method translator. And most of the uh, column manufacturers and most of the instrument manufacturers have a method translation uh, software or some sort of tool on their website. And you can plug in your conditions that you start with, plug in the conditions for your system, and it will translate how to, to change that method so that it will match similarly to the method you found online. But always look online as a place to start. It's always a great place so you don't have to reinvent the wheel totally. Ah, brilliant. Yeah, th thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Patty, for that answer. Um, next question we had is, uh, is the bat block system available for the different HPLC manufacturers or just the major ones? Uh, the Vaplock system is a system that has different jars and tubings and threaded connections. So they have a, a, an entire kit of different connectors, so they can pretty much fit any system out there. They do have some um, common connectors that are common to the major manufacturers, but your um, Cole Palmer or Specs representative can definitely help you by figuring out the thread size for your system and, and what type of system they you know, what type of vape lock system would work for you. Okay, brilliant. Thank, thank you, Patty. Uh, is there a mix of solvents which is best for flushing out uh, a HPLC system? Um, I know for me, I use an LCMS system most commonly. And when I do a system flush to clean out everything to make sure I'm, I've got a clean system, I'm doing my maintenance, I use a mix of solvents, we call it clean flush, and it's a mix of all different polarity solvents. Uh, I talked about those bridge mm -hmm. solvents, the ones that kind of cross over between being polar and nonpolar. So I use quite a few of those. I use acetone and THF and some cyclohexane and some IPA. So I do mix a, take a mix of polar and nonpolar solvents. Uh, this will make sure that I, I get all of the, the compounds that might be sticking in my joints, and my fittings, and, and different places. The one caveat is you want to make sure that whatever column you're also flushing with, and you don't necessarily have to flush with your HPLC column in line. You could put a little union in, in between them and save your column. But most columns will be uh, okay with a mix of different solvents for a short period of time for, you know, a couple of hours. But you want to make sure that you read the column instructions. And if it says do not use high organics, do not use high water, or it has a pH limitation, that you stay within those guidelines because you don't really don't want to damage your column. But otherwise, uh, in many cases, a nice, good, clean flush with a mix of, of all different polarity solvents, all mixed together, uh, does the system good. And, and I would suggest instead of letting it go to your detector, you actually detach your waistline before or your feed line before it goes into your LCMS or your other detector, and you actually plumb that to waste while you do this because you'll be amazed at the junk that you, or the residue that you get out of your system when you give it a nice, good, clean flush every once in a while. <laughs> that sounds uh, that sounds a bit messy to me. Um, it is. <laughs> so, there, someone there is actually asked. Of, there is a lot of plumbing oh, involved. Right. Okay. Yeah. No. That, yeah. Sounds like it. Um, obviously, I'm not the expert. You guys are. So, just on that, actually, someone did ask me while you were 
answering that question. Someone asked me, um, what what is Spec Thirty Prep? Uh, and I think I appreciate we we may not have uh, explained exactly who we are at the beginning, so it might be worth just talking to that question a second. Go ahead, Alan. All right. Well, we are a. Um, uh, as of uh, a year ago, we're a division of uh, Cole Palmer. Uh, we, uh, uh, we we sell uh, certified reference standards. We've been doing that for uh, for over 60 years now. Um, we we have the re uh, certified reference standards, but we also sell uh, a line of spectroscopy uh, uh, units, PCR, um, you know, all kinds of uh, lab supplies. Um, I don't know, Patty. What, what what have I not added? It's a little early for me. Well, all of our chromatography supplies too. Our columns, we well, do deuterium lamps, yeah. and everything else too. And Absolutely. the vapor system. Yeah, we have a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly know you do. Um, all right, thank mm -hmm. you. I think everyone appreciates that. Um, there's just there's only a couple more questions left actually. Uh, so, how long will a mobile phase last um, sitting in the reservoir or are there any significant changes? Uh, you should always have fresh mobile phase when you're about to do an important experiment. If it uh, sits a few hours, not a problem. If it sits overnight, it depends on what it is. Um, we've had some mobile phase that starts to accumulate laboratory contamination, so the different solvents and the different uh, chemicals in the air. I did an experiment once where I was using toluene and over the course of about 24 hours, the baseline noise increased tenfold by just not using fresh toluene. So it depends on what your solvent is. If you have any water-based solvent, they attract mold. So if you have water that's been sitting on your system for, oh, it's been there since, oh, uh, last month, change it out. Do yourself a favor. You really don't want mold particles in your system. So. I would always use fresh mobile phase because your mobile phase reservoirs are open to your lab environment. Yes, they have a cap and they have tubing, but there's usually a vent hole. And that vent hole is big enough to get bacteria, viruses, mold, dust, any other contaminants into it. And the more time you give it to get into that system, the more chance it's going to affect your experiment. So try to use it as fresh as possible. Yeah, we've had a... Uh... We've had one system where we run uh, sugars on it and amino acids and uh, let it sit for a while and definitely could see buildup of bacteria. Very, very, very problematic. Oh, that does not sound good. Um, mm. Just again, while you, were, while you were answering that question, someone's asked us, what is the advantage of spec stand, standards? Uh, uh, they put an oblique, so standard slash sigma or Merck standards. I don't know if that's more of a kind of, you know, as versus the competitors type question. Yeah. Well, I mean, I can tell you that, um, you know, we, we put a, a lot of work into um, uh, uh, all of our ISO standards, how we, uh, you know, we, we weigh our uh, raw materials. We, um, we analyze our raw materials uh, pretty intensely when they first arrive, um, and, and we won't use anything that, that looks odd in any way. We don't just use chromatography. We use uh, NMR, IR, and other methods as well. Um, I, I, I think we uh, I think we produce the best standards personally. I guess I would say that. Well, in the U.S., uh, we are the oldest oldest standards manufacturer. Uh, as Alan said, we uh, Spec Certiprep was in business for over 65 years. Um, mm -hmm. We uh, also are very competitive for our organic standards, so we uh, have a good uh, competitive advantage for our organic standards. And one of our key uh, components is that we create customs to what the customer needs. So if there's a particular mix of analytes, you need a particular matrix, uh, we are able to find uh, a standard and create it for you. So uh, every design that we get for a custom standard is looked over by several chemists. Uh, we make notes. We make uh, suggestions about interactions and solvent and, and matrix and everything else. And we'll, we'll create, we'll work with the customer to create exactly what they need for their analysis. Yeah. Oh, I, I think okay. we really and, um, understand the industry behind what we do. Sorry, Alan, did I cut over? Can you, can you just say again? No, I was just going to say, I think we really understand the chemistry of what we do, and, and, that, and that, that's uh, considered when we analyze uh, the standards, you know, the, the customs like Patty just suggested. 
Yeah, brilliant. Uh, that's excellent. And uh, I've got another question just again while you are answering. Um, what is the best method to clean in the column? Well, that clean flush, uh, as long as you check it, that it doesn't uh, violate any of the instructions for your particular column. Columns can be sensitive to pH. Usually it's pH that they're most sensitive to. They can also be sensitive to an amount of, of water or aqueous phase. So if you um, create a clean flush, which we can uh, definitely include, I can include something in the notes about what clean flush I use for my system. As I said, it's a mix of different solvents. I tend to pick ones that I know that I'm going to use, so uh, or at least compatible with reverse phase and normal phase HPLC. So I use acetone or IPA mixed with any methanol and acetonitrile, and then uh, a nonpolar solvent mixed in as well. And uh, this actually does a good job of cleaning the co of cleaning up the column. As I said before, check with the, the column manufacturer instructions. For the longest time, I'd always take my column out before I put a cleaning uh, fluid through it. Then I spoke to a few column manufacturers, and they said, no, a mix of different solvents isn't going to hurt it as long as you, you, know, you keep to that pH and that water content. So um, the clean flush that I use to flush the entire system is usually pretty good at, at cleaning up the column. I like to... to um, Re, uh, reverse my column when I do cl a cleaning, so I'll clean it the, the normal direction and then I'll reverse it and I'll clean it the other direction for a little while and then I'll just put it back the way it was and uh, I'll, I'll run some normal runs through it. But it does a, a fairly decent job of cleaning it up. You know, it's, it's very helpful to understand the chemistry of, of what you're doing here. I mean, if you imagine you know, you're actually in the lab and you have some uh, organic uh, compounds sitting in an Erlenmeyer flask and you try washing it with water and it doesn't come off. But then if you add acetone, it comes right off. It, it, it's very much like the columns. A lot of these compounds will stick very tightly to these silica materials and uh, you really have to have the right solvent to, to, to pull it off. All going back to the uh, polarity I, index again. <laughs> exactly. It all comes down to polarity. All roads lead to polarity, as they say. All right, well, um, there's, just a, there's only a couple of questions um, left, so um, should my lab pre-filter my mobile phases prior to use, or are the filters in the system enough? That depends on if you're putting any additives in your uh, mobile phases. If you are using them right out of the bottle, most manufacturers do a really good job of filtering their mobile phase before they sell it, especially if you're using an LC or an LCMS grade of mobile phase. They right. do an exceptional job of, of filtering it. If you are adding dissolved salt as a buffer, filter it first. You want to make sure that you're fully dissolved, that you're not getting any particles, and any time you have a, like a critical mobile phase, sometimes if you're doing an amino acid analysis or something else, you have specialized buffers that can be quite pricey. And you might have a bottle and it's been sitting open for a day or two, and you said, well, you know, I, I still want to use it. There is actually no harm in filtering it first if you think that maybe it's, it's gotten a little bit of, of dust or, or possibly there, that something may have settled out a little bit. You want to sonicate it, then filter it. That's not going to hurt. But in general, if you're using pure solvent, you don't have to filter it. The, the little frit filters that are the, at the bottom of the reservoirs do a good job. And a note on that, check those frit filters fairly often. Uh, if you're going to get some dust or accumulation, that's one of the places you're going to see it really quickly. Brilliant. Uh, I, I just love the detail you give in, in, in the answers here. Uh, the, the last question before we, um, before we sign off. Uh, there are now solvents designated as LCMS solvents, not just HPLC solvents. Is there really a difference? Well, uh, the whole designation between LCMS and HPLC is, is sort of a branding issue. Um, there are some differences, and as Alan said in the presentation, you really want to read the manufacturer's description and specification to know what they do to qualify that solvent. In general, if you're doing most LCMS experiments and you're looking at PPMs, levels of stuff, and you're not going to really need an LCMS solvent because they can be also very pricey. If you are doing minute PPB work or you're doing research work and you need no 
contamination whatsoever, then yes, you can invest in an LCMS grade of solvent. The best advice is to try it out and see if it works for you. There might be no difference to your work at all, and then you can save the money and use an LC solvent. Or you might find for the particular work you're doing, you need that extra layer of filtration that they give, that ionic filtration, and then that's something that you need to invest in. Okay, that's brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Alan. Uh, thank you so much, Patty, for your time today. That was an awesome presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, hopefully, everyone tuned in today enjoyed it too. Um, we'll be back in three weeks' time with the Master Sense Master Flex uh, webinar for biopharma people. Um, so watch out for our invitations then. But in the meantime, please do fill out our survey. Um, as you can see, it's at the bottom of your screen, the little pink box on the far right. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, there is a contact us box. There's also, if you want to talk about these products in more detail with an expert, please do click on the request a sales call box. Um, but yeah, it's thank you for turning up today. Uh, we really appreciate you doing that. And um, we will see you all again sometime soon. Thank you.